Good morning. Uh, those of you who are fortunate to have been with us already for Paul Scott's overview of his show have been introduced to his exceptional work and new American scenery. With the aid of Alturas Foundation Artists Award and the Arts Council England, Paul Scott has been able to investigate transfer wares and contemporary landscape of North America, which has led to the substantive and compelling body of work. Other funders along the way are Farron Contemporary and the RISD Museum. Paul Scott is an English artist living and working in Cumbria, UK. He is an author and a professor. He, by appropriating traditional blue and white transfer wares, he makes artwork relevant for today and a 20, 21st century audience. Using his techniques of selective erasure, uh, print, collage, breakage, and assembly, he alters the vocabulary of historic tablewares to show and comment on contemporary landscape. Scott's Cumbrian Blues artworks can be found in private and public collections around the world including the VA in London, National Museums of Norway, Scotland, Sweden, and Wales. In the United States, his work can be found in art museums in Boston, Brooklyn, Newark, the Carnegie in Pittsburgh, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, Chip Stone and Alturas Found Foundations, as well as the RISD Museum. Please join me in welcoming Paul Scott to RISD today. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and um, uh, to talk about the exhibition. Um, those of you who've had the, the pre-talk talk <laughs> in the gallery um, will uh, have already seen and understood a little bit about this, but it's very hard to distill five or six years' work into a 45-minute presentation. And uh, I had terrible trouble um, trying to reduce the size of my talk. And every time I went to take pictures out, I ended up putting more in. So, But I, I hopefully I can um, skim over some areas that I've already talked about and um, go into some more depth in the areas that I didn't. So let me first of all just give you a slight, a little background about why and how I became interested in transferware. Many years ago, in the early 1990s, I wrote a little handbook called Ceramics and Prints, which was really a response to the fact that within contemporary ceramic practice, very little was written about how to print on ceramics. And I couldn't understand it. If you went into the department store and bought a place, it had a print on it. But if you bought any, any books about studio pottery, they didn't mention printmaking. And any books about printmaking didn't mention ceramics. It was like there was a conspiracy of silence. So I, anyway, I wrote this little handbook, which did very well. And after doing it, I realized that there was a whole body of work here that wasn't in the public domain, or it wasn't, it wasn't put together in any way. And I approached the local art museum where I live and, uh, in Cumbria and worked with a, my, late, my friend, the late Terry Bennis. And um, Terry, um, yeah, Terry, Terry and I basically um, created this exhibition called Hot Off the Press Ceramics and Prints. So whereas the book looked at how to do it, the exhibition looked at the reasons why people were using his ceramics and print and its history. And Terry said to me at the time, you, must, you are going to make something new for the show, aren't you, Paul? And I said, oh, yeah, all right, okay, I'll, I'll do something different. And, and it had been in my mind a number of years to do... I was already working with printed ceramics, but I was just sort of collaging on handmade forms and things. But it had been in my mind to make something that alluded to transferware and the willow pattern. And so I did a series of plates over a short time um, about Sellafield. Sellafield's a nuclear reprocessing plant on the west coast, northwest coast of England, and it reprocesses nuclear waste. And it was the site of the, the site um, of uh, the 
the production of the first radioactive material for Britain's first bomb. And it has a, it has a very checkered history of safety and um, environmental issues. Anyway, I made these plates. And uh, much to my amazement, I had the exhibition, we had the exhibition and I sold the addition of 10 plates I made. But it was great though, isn't it? You, artists, you, you make some work, it's really interesting to do, and you sell it. It's like, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> and I also realized that there was an awful lot more I could do with it. <laughs> and you know, you, you can, the great thing about printing on ceramics is that you don't have to print on plates, you can print on anything that's ceramic. So this is one of my nuclear toilets. You know, give us your nuclear waste and we'll flush it into the Irish Sea. Um, and I was hooked. Because then I started looking at the history of transferware and I started looking at different patterns and I was hooked. And over the years, I've, you know, that has become the main strand of my practice. And a few years ago, I, I, I curated this exhibition at the National Museum in Oslo, and which looked, again, at um, landscape and uh, contemporary uh, landscape, transfer, and contemporary ceramics. Now, my journey around American transferware um, started really, I think, in 1999 when I was invited to give a lecture at Ohio State University in Columbus. And the uh, professor there was Mary Jo Boll, MJ. And um, after I'd done my lecture, they, they took, you know, I was in the ceramic office and they were showing me their ceramics collection. And to be honest, I wasn't that bothered about, <laughs> about most of it um, because I'm not a great aficionado of studio, of brown studio pots. Uh, but in the back of the cabinet in the corner was this glint of a blue platter. And uh, I got them to take it out for me. And it was one of those transformative moments that you have every so often. Because, you know, I'd been researching transferware, and I knew about transferware, but I had never seen a plate as dark as this and as beautiful in its depth and its subtlety. And this is an Enoch Woods platter of the Hudson River. And a few years later, I was invited to have a residency at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. And I used my time at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia to pursue my interest in transferwares and visit the Philadelphia Art Museum. Um, what's it called? Um, uh, the Winterthur, which has a fab collection of transferware. And I made a small body of work, which as I explained before, one of which was this uh, lovely um, Philadelphia souvenir. This is the back of it. So it's American scenery and it's got a clay studio stamp on it and the England stamp is the original one. And, um, and that's, and you know the story about the Alturas Foundation from then on. Um, I, I, I started collecting all kinds of American transferwares, not just the early 19th century ones. They're very expensive usually. But you can pick up these early 20th century souvenirs quite cheaply, I like this. The hairpin turn, the picturesque Mohawk Trail, Massachusetts made by Adams in Stoke-on-Trent about 1930. And the text on the back of the plate says, you can roam where fancy leads you over hill and dale, but you haven't seen America till you've seen the Mohawk Trail. <laughs> and the great thing is that the picture, the, yeah, the main scene is a hairpin turn. Isn't that great? <laughs> God bless our camper. <laughs> made in Japan. This is nice. The, the Pennsylvania German Folklore Society of Ontario, made by Johnson Brothers in Stoke-on-Trent about 1960, and I bought it in Wigton in Cumbria in England. Transfer where it gets around the world, you know. This is nice. Tombstone, Arizona, the town too tough to die. <laughs> Guns, graveyards. Um, and, and because of the funding, the support from... Uh, the Alturas Foundation and uh, other funding, I was able to do a, a series of journeys in America to pursue my interests uh, and travel through the American landscape. And, and I was able to make a detour on one of my journeys, and I visited Tombstone, Arizona, and here is the Birdcage Theatre uh, that commissioned that original souvenir place. And I went into the museum in Tombstone, Arizona, which is not a big place, um, and what did I find? I found English transferware. Isn't that amazing? 
Now, some people might question, why is this English guy wandering around and making us an exhibition of American scenes? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, one of a, a long line of people who've visited America and who've made observations about their travels and made pictures about them and, um, and have written about it. America's very, you're very good at selling yourselves, you know? I grew up with America. I grew up with television, with American television. I grew up with American landscape, and I listened to American music. Um, this is a book. This was a book uh, called "Democracy in America" by the French writer, and uh, you know was a very influential in its time. Um, a Frenchman coming to America and writing about democracy, and then spreading the notion of democracy to other places. This, this guy is particularly interesting. A Russian paints America, the travels of Pavlel P. Svinin, from 1811 to 1813. And Pavel traveled in early 19th century America and wrote about his travels. He published a book in 1815, which was illustrated by reproductions of his paintings. And these paintings were seized upon by English transferware potters, and they copied them. Enoch Wood must have, had, must have had a copy of his book, because there are a number of Enoch Wood designs that are lifted directly from Pavel's book. So here you have a Russian picturing America, whose pictures are then picked up by an Englishman in a Staffordshire factory, who then shipped them back to America, and they became part of Americana. They became part of American culture. Somebody who's nearer to my time was Claire Layton, the illustrator and wood engraver. And Claire Layton was an English lady, an English artist, who actually came to America and actually settled in America and became American. But she came from England and depicted America um, with her English sensibilities. And she did some wonderful, wonderful, if you don't know Claire Layton, you should look her up, wonderful wood engravings, lovely book illustrations. And she did do some pieces for Wedgwood as well. Um, this, is from her, this is from her book, Growing New Roots, which was about becoming an American. And I rather like, I love this piece. The American genius, change, diversity, and stability. <laughs> That's maybe something that might be worth thinking about at the moment. Is it? I like the change, diversity, and stability. Anyway, um, in England, we've, we've also had visitors in England who've written about England. And uh, one of them was a, a Chinese artist called Jiang Li. Jiang Li. And he was a, a, um, a Chinese artist who lived in London in the 1930s. And, when he, and he caught the train and he went to the Lake District. And he did this lovely guidebook uh, about his journey traveling through the Lake District. And it's illustrated with his paintings. And you can see the one on the cover. It looks very Chinese, but it's actually the Lake District. And I thought it was interesting that that was how he saw the Lake District. Um, but then he subsequently, they, they became very popular, and he subsequently traveled all over. And here's one, the silent traveler in New York. So he's something else worth looking at if you ever get a chance. So I feel like I'm following in footsteps, not only the Staffordshire potters that made the blue and white, but artists and writers as well. This is um, my Dover copy of R.T. Haynes House's pictures of early New York on dark blue Staffordshire pottery. And um, Shax Riegler, who wrote an article about my work for Antiques magazine, told me once that I should get this book. And I said, oh, it's all right, Shax, I've already got the book. He said, no, 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 not the Dover one. He said the original one. And this is a little bit of that original one. I, and that there should be a little, is it going to work? Come on. No, it's not going to work. Never mind, you don't need to see that. You've seen a page of it already. Um, I discovered things. I've done a lot of documentary research, you see. So I discovered things like an auction um, catalog from the, from the auction of Haynes House's collection of transferware with the prices that the pieces have re reached. This is, um, this, is the this is the front page of Edwin Attlee Barber's 
book. I told you Atali Barber became the director of the Philadelphia Art Museum, the first director. Just loads of literature. If you ever want to know about Transport Web, there's lots of literature about it. And I even got, I bought this one on eBay, and, um, and I found that on the inside of it <coughs> that um, it's got a letter from Ella Louise Baker Larson to the um, editor of Home magazine. That was rather lovely. It's all incidental, this. It's not really important. Anyway. So, if you were in my talk earlier, you'll have heard about <coughs> my discovery of the prints <coughs> and drawings in the v and Just have a quick sip. This is, how <coughs> this is how they were presented to me. And this is what it's like. It's got paintings like this. And this is the preparatory painting for the engraver who made this, the transferware for this piece. It's just extraordinary. It's full of preparatory paintings for borders and what have you. It's just wonderful. And I've also worked in the Wedgwood Museum. The Wedgwood Museum has got a large number of pattern books and correspondence for transferware that they produced at the start of the 20th century. Here we are. I like this one. This is, this is from a souvenir of Rhode Island. I don't know what those guys are doing on the cliff. There are four guys on a cliff. It's rather nice, isn't it? Um, and these are some charming little details, like these roller skaters. I like this one. <laughs> a project that never materialized. <laughs> the amazing thing is that they also have the correspondence between their offices in New York and Boston and the engraving department. So, like, they're very specific about what they want. Please remove what seems to be a hat or turban from the head of the statue at the left of the picture. Shade what somewhat, the six columns at the front of the building. Add a floor of the building. Yeah, add to the floor of the I mean, you know, very specific instructions to the engravers to alter their artwork. And then there is the insight into their dealings. If you've ever had any experience with committee management, you will know what we're up against in getting these back stamps. There are 32 old ladies <laughs> involved in this, and each one wants a different wording. <laughs> Furthermore, more than half of them are out of town for the summer and cannot be reached. <laughs> I will try again, but if, if you do not have the wording in time, I'm afraid you'll have to run the samples without it. <laughs> ah, it's been a hoot. Uh, anyway, um, and I found these things, you know, um, this is um, a page from the pattern book in the Wedgwood Archive, this is Albany, and here's the detail of it, and then I was in the Albany Institute of History and Art, and what did I discover? But the original watercolour painting, and here I am with Douglas McCombs looking at his stash of paintings in the, prints to pr in the paintings and prints collection. And here's the, here's the Wedgwood piece from the early, early 20th century, I think it is. Yeah. And this is my friend Paul, Paul Holdway, um, in, the, in, the, in the Copper Plate Archive in Stoke-on-Trent in the Spode Museum. And I love the um, names of the transferwares. Empress Eli... Ermine, Empire, Ellesmere, Elgin. It's very poetic, you know. These are from the these are the labels from the pens that hold the copper plates. You can go into the Stoke on Trent Library and you can look at their pattern books, Temple and Tower Picnic. And I'm just going to show you here how to how I harvest material. This is the Tower Picnic, and this is a pattern I discovered in research in the copper plate archive that I'd never seen before. And you can see it's like, if you're familiar with Spode, you may recognize the pattern, the tower pattern. But in this particular one, there's a family having a picnic on the foot, on the, by the riverbank here. So what would happen is that Paul will, will create 
what's called a scotch print. A scotch print is a, a print from the top of the copper. It's not intaglio, it's not taken from the lines, but it's taken from the relief. And he calls them scotch prints. And then I scan them into my computer, invert them, and then flip them, and then this gives me what went on the ceramic plate. And um, you may think, why is he showing us a, a tower picnic? What's, got, what's that got to do with America? Well, I discovered on one of the plates, oh, I discovered on one of the plates, the Hamburg America line. So these, this pattern was commissioned by the Hamburg America line for its restaurants in the liners which brought American, which brought European migrants to the United States at the end of the 19th and in the early 20th century. So, anyway, cut plates. You've, we, I did a little talk about cut plates. I love the fact America, transferware, transferware collectors are, are very thorough. So this is, this is uh, American cut plates part one. <laughs> it's a part two as well. Um, you know, it's the aqueduct bridge. Um, that little, I told you there were lots of pictures of canals and things, didn't I? Um, uh, I've been intrigued by the way museums um, uh, put their acquisition numbers on objects. <laughs> At some point, somebody thought it was a good idea to put it on the front of the plate. I look, this is one of those nice collage ones. Nice. This is one. This is one I own, um, a clues one. And the nice rubber, the nice stamp on the back of it. You can see the pearlware. You can see the the, the blue, the grey blue brings out the relief, you know. And here's Paul and Kath in their kitchen, with their collection of cut plates, and we're discussing this cut plate project. And um, this is the artwork I gave to Paul. Um, as the original, you know, the idea to work from. And this is the, the, the rose border that he objected to because the stems were coming from the wrong way. And here he is in his, in his studio uh, with his working um, designs. So the only thing left of my design is that <laughs> is the nuclear power station in the distance. He changed everything else. He thought there was too much river in it. Um, and here he is. Engraving. Now, this hopefully this will work. It did before. Come on. Oh man. How can I get him to work? Come on. Oh good. Now oh, the sound's gone. Oh no, here it is. Okay, so this is how to engrave a copper plate, right? And this is Paul going over the plate is already engraved to deepen. The, the little roundels in the border. And it's a bit squishy, the, the videoing, but you can see the detail. Oh, no, it's a th I think that's a three-punch one, that is. I think uh, Paul's son, uh, Rob, did the video for me. And it goes on. I could leave it on for you, but, <laughs> but it's much the same. It's just a different part of the plate. So I have great admiration for his skill and his knowledge. And here's the, here's the copper plates, here's a test print and here's a test piece. And I, you've seen them downstairs. This piece is in the cabinet. Um, and, and we've had to do extensive testing to get, we still haven't got the color right. We wanted to more closely match the 19th century pieces. And we've had a terrible time with it. We're still working on it. They've got my stamps on the way. 
So here's Syracuse. So this is another pottery uh, um, factory, which is closed. And um, here, here's some of the remains, some silos. I think they had glaze or clay in them, I think. And I, and I did look through the, the whole of the um, archive in the Historical Association. I like this one, the Harmer in Roosevelt Blue. Um, and when I went outside, we found um, the Harmer Palm Graffiti on the, on the abandoned silo. <laughs> And of course, these. This is where the china came from that we used, that I used on the Syracuse plates. <clears throat> and they've been there since whenever the factory closed. Amazingly, there were, there were some of them which had these paper stickers on them. Anyway, I better, need, I better hurry up. So I got Holly Lyco to collect them for me. You've seen this, <coughs> and a oak leaf border. And what did I find in the V&A? That here's the preparatory painting for the engraver to copy, to make the copper plate, to make those original plates. Isn't that wonderful? And here's my version. Fleur de Sels, New York, hot dogs. And uh, this is the artwork for my screen print. And here's the plate. And on the back of the plate, uh, there's some, on some of these works, you know, there's more on the back than there is on the front. <laughs> um, my stamps. Um, and the back stamps on the back of the Syracuse, okay, the number, is, the number under the Syracuse China is code for the year the plate was made. So that's 1971, which is their centenary year, plus the, a number of years within the nomenclature, and A stands for the first quarter of the year. So 37D is the third quarter of 2008. So you can even date the, when the plates were made. And this is Fleur de Sel's uh, Instagram feed. And here's some of Fleur de Sel's New York. And I like it because it's, that's how New York is. It's not all the fancy stuff in the middle. It's communities, um, working class neighborhoods. Um, yeah, you've seen that. American Marine, an old plate from the 1850s. And I've spoken about this. So you, you've seen this platter in the room, but it's the one that I found particularly disturbing and, and sort of coloured quite a lot of what I did um, as part of this project. Um, this is the original um, illustration that it was copied from. But you'll notice that the, 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 the platter's got an American flag on it. The original piece, the original ship doesn't. So it was made for America. And here's the piece that you've seen in the cabinet, which has got the link between the slave trade and uh, Providence uh, in the distance. So you've seen this, and I've talked about this, so I'll, I'll skip. If you missed the, um, the gallery talk, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, you haven't seen this yet, and if you come back to the gallery late this afternoon, you will notice that there's a new piece in the exhibition. When I came to do the research here, um, this, this painting was on show. So I saw the Cape Coast Castle piece, and then I saw Andy Warhol's Race Riot. Um, it, it's slightly oddly named, because actually it wasn't a race riot. Um, civil rights protesters were attacked by police with dogs and water hoses. It wasn't exactly a riot. In fact, you look in the background, the guys, there's a guy in the background there with a suit and a tie on. Um, not the sort of thing you dress up to go on a riot route, is it? Um, and I asked my friend and fellow uh, artist, uh, Mara Superior, who lives in, uh, in Massachusetts, if she would be interested in collaborating on a piece. And I, sh I gave her images of Enoch Wood transfer wares, and she made me a porcelain platter uh, with these beautiful relief uh, details in the border. And uh, here's me working on a hand-painted piece, not a printed piece. 
And here is the peace that I haven't yet seen for real. This is the only, I've seen the photo. Mara's seen it. I haven't seen it. Anyway, it's going to go in the cabinet alongside the uh, Cape Coast Castle piece. Because it, it marries, it, it updates, it, yeah, it, it updates things. And um, it's also about painting and printing and the appropriation of images and images moving between different media. And yeah, I could give you a lecture about that. Here's Salma. This is the anniversary march. You can tell this is recent because of all the selfies, the, 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 all the iPhones and selfies. <laughs> this, is, this is the plate that I appropriated. I bought this on eBay, it cost me three pounds. It's a bargain. And I removed, the, I removed all the Jackson, Mississippi stuff and reworked it and I created the anniversary plate for Selma. I like these two on the bridge. There was chatting, standing chatting. There was a guy in a, a motorized sort of a, um, invalid carriage thing uh, and the lady just chatting on the bridge, it was lovely. The police car outside the Voting Rights Museum. I thought that was a change of scenery. And, um, and then Broad Street. And this is Broad Street. And the fact is that Selma is, is round by the bridge. There's lots of touristy shops and things like that. But if you walk away just a few hundred yards, the place looks neglected and down at heel. And I went to Sturdivant Hall, which is one of the finest examples of neoclassical architecture in the South. And I was profoundly disturbed that nowhere in this wonderful building, in this beautiful building, which was, had fabulous wallpaper and furniture, nowhere was there any mention of the, of the origin of the wealth of the people who built the house, nor were there any mention of the servants and slaves who worked there, and I thought it was very disturbing. This is the back of the Roland Marcellus plate, and this is the back of my plate. And this is what Chris wrote in The Guardian. The Edmund Pettus Bridge is recognizable from newsreels of Bloody Sunday when marchers were beaten by the police or when President Obama came to mark the 50th anniversary of that day. The central street beyond the bridge is three short blocks filled with shops catering to tourists. Yet if you walk behind these blocks, you see the ugliness of poverty that is modern Selma, dilapidated and boarded up homes, tagged with gang symbols, empty lots littered with vodka bottles and fast food wrappers and sterile low-income projects. You see men clustered on corners selling drugs and on the better-kept homes, you see sign after sign urging to stop the violence. You don't see working factories, only empty ones being torn for scrap. You see a population disenfranchised economically and politically. It makes Selma a symbol of past civil rights victories, a symbol of current civil rights failures. On salvaging bricks from an old cotton warehouse, this is slave work, that's what it is. That's the only work around. Kind of funny when you think about it, because them bricks were probably made by slaves. This is Selma for you though, still a city of slaves. Special things did happen here, I just wish they would happen again. So I, they're bittersweet, they're, you know, it's celebratory and it's like, it's not good enough, is it? Okay, this is my Joseph Stubbs border. This is my tissue print that I found in the V&A. And here's the plate. Fairmount near Philadelphia. And here's me, um, I hope this is, yeah, this is going to work. Come on. No. Oh, come on. I just wanted to show you. Oh, there we are. Right, so people, people ask me, people are always interested in how to do it, so I'm just, this is a little bit of how to do it. So this is, this is, um, this is artwork, this is me working on the Joseph Stubbs border on my iPad. So you can see, you know, although I can photograph something, there's an awful lot of work to do to make that photograph into something that I can print. It's akin to the kind of detail that Paul does with his engraving but I do it digitally. Yeah, so I had to clean it all up and then I had to patch it and rework it. But uh, an iPad's a wonderful thing to use to do this kind of thing. Yeah. And this is one of the borders and I told you about the flint waterworks and the, the lump of lead 
on the glaze that's created that watery effect. Yeah. More back stumps. I like the back stumps. They all tell a story, you see. Um, there's Ferring Contemporary and there's, um, there's the V&A. There's a stamp there from the V&A. That's one of the old stamps I found on the um, on material in the archive. I've done pieces that uh, also examine other um, injustices. And um, the Angola Three were banged up for something they didn't do um, and kept in solitary confinement for years. And the, the legend about it is on the back. And, and um, I know that uh, Elizabeth and the RISD Museum are working on a gallery guide, and this information will be available to you while you're in the gallery. Um, so you'll be able to read the text on these pieces. And, and the idea of these cartouches with uh, portraits uh, on the borders it actually came from the historic pieces. So you find this, this is a picture of, this is Boston Hospital, but they just slapped a picture of Washington and Clinton on the top and the entrance of the canal into the Hudson at Albany on the bottom. <laughs> um, and, and here is, you know, here is the stuff about writing on the backs of plates. Why have I put writing on the back? Well, it's common. You know, Wedgwood did lots of this. Um, this is the, the Harrison Mansion in Indiana. And you'll see the letter here. This drawing will require touching up on the engraving. The mistake is the customers. They didn't examine the original drawing carefully enough. The left-hand windows were originally used as gun ports through which the serfs of the Harrison family slaughtered poor Indians. Hence, it's important to show them with the shutters closed. Um, <laughs> this, is big, this is near Big Bend in Texas, and it's a gas pipeline. And this is the uh, Keystone Pipeline in North Dakota. And this is a, an oil spill that happened just a few weeks ago. And as you know, there's a good deal of controversy about putting pipelines through American Indian reservations and American Indian land. And, um, you know, uh, this is a piece which is about pipelines. Oh, look, pipelines. Pipelines and Peltier, it should say. Leonard Peltier has been uh, incarcerated for something that he didn't do in the 1970s, and he's still in prison. Again, you can read this text when you see the exhibition guide. And finally, on the American Indian, Native American issue, I read this book as part of my research. I came across it somewhere. And um, it tells the scandalous story of uranium mining in the 50s and 60s and 70s that employed Navajo men uh, in terrible conditions, which caused the loss of a generation through... Uh, related illnesses. This is the mine, the road to Mesa Mine in Cove, Northern Arizona, and I was, deep, I was very privileged to spend time with this gentleman, Timothy Benali. Timothy Benali um, was, an, was a worker in the uranium mines, and I located him as part of my research, and I actually stayed with him and his wife, and he drove me around for two days telling me stories about his life and what have you. This is, you can go up to these mines, there's still bits of uranium lying around, uranium ore lying around. And here is Timothy heading back to his truck, and there's a uranium glass melted into the plate. And there are quotes on the back of the plate from the uh, Navajo. They have ruined our land. There is spring water, and they put holes in our mountains and left them unsafe. To this day, low radiation is spreading its disease amongst us. They had piled up uranium ore beside the road, which they never took care of completely when they left. They really did nothing in that way. They thought of us Navajos as nothing. That's how I think about it, and it really hurts my heart and mind. So the, the scandal was that people were employed in the mines with prop, without proper safety, um, and many a whole generation of men died um, in the na Navajo Nation. Uh, but the, the legacy is still there. And it's juxtaposed by these friendly greetings between settlers and Americans. So
souvenir of Shiprock, <laughs> which is the, the site of a large uranium dump. Again, you can read this in the... Um, So here's my jug. No, it's not my jug. This is the first jug that sort of wet my appetite when I was curating the exhibition in the museum in Oslo. What a nice jug. And it was commissioned for Norwegian Independence Day. Um, and it was made by a pottery in the northeast of England. And this is in the V&A. If you go to London and you go to the V&A, you can see this. It's an astonishing thing. The 12 gallon, oh, the 30 gallon jug. Wonderful thing. And here's the Troy jug. Here's me with the Troy jug in Albany. And a new model made by my friend Ed. And the, that's the model. This is the mold. It's so big that they have to, they have to move it with um, one of those things. And here they are in the factory. And in my studio at home after being glazed. And these are the collages I told you about. This is, this is, this is made in 1815. Isn't that amazing? It's a, it's a collage, 1815. And this is rather lovely. Andrew Baseman's um, Dairyland Sampler. That's like what salesmen would have to try and flog their wares. That's from Andrew Baseman's collection in New York. And here are my jugs. Look, here we are. This. So the difference in colour there is just uh, the, on the lacquer that you use to make the transfer. Um, yeah. So you you can see these downstairs, but I'm going to go through these because this, this shows all the way around the jug, if you like. Stay dirty. It's called stay dirty, this jug. Because, oh, I like, yeah, I like the way they talk to each other. <laughs> you know, but they're like, well, they're obviously not speaking here. <laughs> yeah, stay dirty. This is from the bridge in Bell Island in Detroit. I thought it was great, that image. And there, here it is. This is Bell Island Bridge, Detroit in the park. And I thought it updated this scene from the river in, in Pennsylvania. You see, most transfer is in the storage. So this was in the storage at Philadelphia Art Museum. It's not on display. It's interesting, the backs of the pieces, you know, because some of them have quite a lot of um, detail on them. The collectors over the years have noted on them and written on them. And then museums have different um, acquisition numbers, and they update them, but they never take the other one away. So some of them have got half a dozen numbers on the back of them. It's extraordinary to be able to see that, because that was engraved in maybe 1820. And you, you would never see that detail, because on the plate, the colors melted in the glaze. So it's very privileged to be able to see that, I think. And there's my rather cruder um, thing that I talked about. And here's the ghost gardens. Uh, uh, this, I, didn't, I didn't stage this. Uh, one way, up. <laughs> Isn't it? There's only one way. It's going <laughs> to... After where we are now, one way up.
And uh, I was shown around, Det I told you I was shown around by Tony Detroit and my friend Scott Wrench. So on the backs of the plates, you'll, you'll find there's, there's usually a number of figures. So this is me and Scott Wrench and Tony Detroit. So when you see the backs of the plates, um, they'll have references to the people who helped me on my journey. And this is the Arctic scenery plate. I couldn't resist putting this in for you, just to show you what it's like. <laughs> I love it. Arctic scenery with all those exotic cats and flowers around the outside. And I've also looked at things, oh, I, I'm running out of time here. I've also looked at things that, you know, other, media, other things about American landscape, and Thomas Cole is one of those people. Um, it's interesting that Thomas Cole's paintings have appeared on transferware. Um, and uh, Nancy Siegel did a lovely book about um, Thomas Cole and the dissemination of American landscape imagery. And I've, I love this text here. This is what um, Thomas Cole said. School opportunities were very small. Reading and music were amongst my recreations, but drawing occupied most of my leisure hours. My first attempts were made from cups and saucers. From them, I rose to copying prints, from copying prints to making originals. My employment in my father's business was somewhat to my mind, but there was too little art and too much manual labor for one of an imaginative mind. What he's talking about is that his first attempts were made from cups and saucers, suggesting that he made his first designs from transferware. And his father was an engraver. So I went to see the famous Oxbow with Leslie Ferrin. And, and we drove up there in April. But the road was closed because it was the wrong time of year. So we had to turn back. And we turned back and just stopped by the road, by the river. And this is what we found. A chimney across the river from an industrial plant and trees peppered with no entry signs. And I thought it was my piece after Thomas Cole. So this is near the Oxbow after Thomas Cole. He'd be spinning in his grave. And Grant Woods is another one who dabbled with transferware this piece here, you know, the overmantel decoration, owes a lot to, um, he owes a lot to Courier and Ives prints, but also to transferware. And uh, this text talks about that. And here's a bit of Courier and Ives. And here's a railway. You see, this is the segway, the segway things. This is a railway. And here's the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which is really the Hetton Railroad in England, which I've talked about already. You've seen this. And here's the, the contemporary railroad. Oh, it's West 18th Street, it's not Canal Street. This is Philadelphia. So I did a series of cities updating the transferwares. The New Jersey Turnpike, you've seen this. This is work in progress. This is collaging the Houston one. I did this after the floods in Houston in 2017 when they threatened to engulf the city. I did that work in Chicago. And here's residual waste, with the residual waste popping out from the plate. And this one's not in the show, but it's part for the series. And um, here, the, the ironstone plate started spitting out all kinds of stuff. Every time I fired it, there was more bits in the sky. It's nothing to do with me. It's just happened. <laughs> but it's rather nice, isn't it? And some plates crack. Unfortunately, I didn't have room for a cracked plate in the show. But this is from my fracking series. So the plate cracked. And I thought, well, that's, that's perfect for a piece about fracking, isn't it? And the first pieces I made, I just left the cracks as they were. And the later pieces, I filled them with gold like the Japanese process of kintsugi. I found these lovely patterns in the V&A with birds on. And I removed the birds and I inserted the birds that had disappeared from the American landscape in the last century. The heath hen, the Carolina parakeet and the passenger pigeon and the ecstasy's blue butterfly. Forget me not. 
And these are the fish that have become extinct in the last century. And this is what's happening to our ecosystem. And this is appropriate still today. I did this idea a couple of years ago, but of course California wildfires are, are raging now. And this is California too, this is the border. And this is Arizona. And this is New Mexico. And this is Texas. And this is called across the borderline. And I went to the border with Leslie, and uh, there were people celebrating on the, on the, there was like a dance troupe of the Mexicans in the middle, doing it like a, it was a lovely, it was a lovely day, so friendly, so nice. And here are the people on the wrong side. And I found the language that's being used to describe people fleeing from war and people looking for a better life, to be dehumanizing. And I love this um, quote from Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and Holocaust survivor. You are so-called illegal aliens must know that no human being is illegal. That is a contradiction in terms. Human beings can be beautiful or more beautiful. They can be fat or skinny. They can be right or wrong, but illegal? How can a human being be illegal? And um, It's made after this plate, this text plate. And you've seen this. The only bits of transferware in British museums that are American are usually broken, like this shelf in the Potter's Museum, because it was all exported. And I love this pattern. This is the Castle Battery, New York, by Enoch Wood and Sons. Such a lovely plate. And here's the print from Haynes Halsey. Isn't that fab? And here's a fragment because I acquired a New York um, Battery Park place. Somebody had seen my work, I think, at the New York Ceramics Fair and contacted me via Leslie and said, I've got this plate, would you like it? It's broken, broken by our maid or in brackets, our ex made. <laughs> um, and so I agreed to, yeah, I said, yeah, it'd be great. Anyway, they, they charged me 150 bucks and then the shipping, and it, was, it wasn't, it, ca it cost about 300 bucks, I think, in the end. Anyway, um, and it came and it was in bits, and of course, but it had already been restored. So I had to refire the thing to burn away the restoration. But it gave me these lovely, um, this lovely quality and in the, in, in the edges there. And uh, I, I struggled with them for a while, and then I decided that I was going to insert them into perfectly good, undamaged Leeds pottery pearlware platters, and it was a very hard thing to do, to actually cut a hole in a perfectly good plate. I'm used to, I'm used to using broken plates, but cutting a hole in a good one is... <gasps> but actually, I'm very pleased with them, because then, they're not, then there's, nothing, there's no messages in this. This is about celebrating... Uh, beautiful objects and looking at them in, with, fresh, with fresh eyes and giving them a new life. So this is the platter as a triptych and you can see that in the show. And finally, and I'm going to shut up now, um, my Indian point plates. I told you about Haynes House's lovely book and this wonderful photogravures from the from 120 years ago. And I want to do a new version. But this time, I want to put in some platters that were missing from the original book. So I want to include the Cape Coast Castle platter. But I also want to put my own things in and create a new artist book which, which references Haynes Halsey and celebrates the New American Scenery Project. And this is a, to say thank you to the Alturas Foundation, Artists in Residence Programme, Project Art and Fair and Contemporary, RISD Museum, Arts Council England, and all the other people who have helped me to make this a reality. And here I have to thank uh, Andrew 
Andrew Raftery in particular, um, for introducing me to the museum and being my host on many occasions when I visited here, uh, and to Leslie, who was also in the audience. And um, yeah, and that's about it. You can wake up now. <laughs> Okay. Do you want any questions already? Have you had enough? I've been talking a long time here. So. Yes, yes. The protest position? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, British, British uh, transfer wear has long been associated with political. Um, Protest. So, I mean, you could say that all those tran all those English transfer wares um, from the 19th century are actually political in one way because they depict they de they depict uh, they depict landscapes that have been formed by political events. I mean, the, um, and they depict the British Empire and things like that. But they were overtly political campaigns. Josiah Wedgwood um, produced uh, abolitionist ceramics. Um, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, or in the, in the 19th century, um, and there were transfer wares which campaigned against the Corn Laws in Britain. So that there is a tradition of um, political campaigning that runs through. And I think that's partly because transfer wear is about print, and print is a dissemination of information and was used for campaigning. And it was just natural that these things went from paper and went onto ceramics. So it's part of the tradition. I'm not new. What I'm doing isn't new. I just follow... I'm just following the tradition, if you like. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Well, I suppose I've taken it a bit further than, than yeah, I've taken it a bit further than the historical pieces, but um, it is within that transferware tradition. It's, it is part of the genre. Um, in fact, the Mint Museum, where I was in the other day, have, a, have, have some wonderful anti-slavery abolitionist ceramics in, their, in one of their galleries. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, so I think the question is, do, you know, do I start with an idea and then go and find the images, or do the images uh, inf create? Um, it's a bit of both, really. And and um, a great, of course, one of the great things about the internet is that um, you can Google for images. And in fact, for example, the pictures, the picture of Leonard Peltier in the Peltier and Pipelines piece came from uh, an American journalist, uh, Kevin McKeon. And Kevin McKeonian was at the uh, was at the event where Leonard Peltier was alleged to have shot FBI agents. He was a journalist at the time, and because of the internet, I was able to find um, Kevin McKeonian, and I wrote to Kevin McKeonian and said I'd like a picture of Leonard Peltier because I saw he'd done some portraits of Leonard, and so I've developed a communication with um, Kevin McKeonian as a result of. Um, trying to make that piece. Um, so sometimes I, so it, I, I never use photographs without permission. Um, I think, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, artists were borrowing stuff left, right and centre, collaging stuff together without crediting photographers. And I know that Warhol had, Andy Warhol had to sort out, Andy Warhol was um, sued by a number of photographers for the use of their images without creditation. And the guy, whose name escapes me now, who did the race riot, that the race riot is um, based upon, um, settled out of court with Warhol um, because it was, it was a famous image in newspapers and Warhol just borrowed it and used it. So I'm, I'm a bit more, I, and especially in the digital age when 
images seep everywhere. I think it's important that where you have photographers and fellow professionals that you acknowledge them and you, you're professional with them and your dealings with them. Um, so I usually do it like a swap deal. You know, you let me have a photograph, I'll let you have a piece of work. Um, and I, but I also photograph a lot myself and I use digital processes to turn my photographs into things that look like um, transfer-wear engravings. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Okay. I think you're done. <laughs>